Chapter Thirteen of Esther Reed Yet Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Esther Reed Yet Speaking by Pansy. Chapter Thirteen. Let us be fashionable. One feature of the hour was not only entirely new to the boys, but gave them a curious feeling, the name of which they did not understand. When the last one sat back in his chair, thereby admitting himself vanquished. Mrs. Roberts, looking at the young man who sat at the foot of the table, said, "'Will you return thanks?' What did that mean? To be sure, they had heard of thanking people, but even they were aware that it was an unusual thing for persons to demand thanks for themselves. They watched. Behold, the young man bowed his head, and these were the words he spoke. "'Dear Saviour, we thank Thee for the joys of this evening. We pray Thee to teach us so to live, that we may all meet some day in our Father's house. Amen. The boys looked at one another, then looked down at their plates. Their sole experience of prayer was connected with the South End Mission. To meet it at a supper table was a revelation. Did the people who lived in grand houses and had such wonderful things to eat always pray at their supper tables? This was the problem which they were turning over in their minds. Returning to the parlor, Gracie went at once to the piano. She had spent a good deal of Monday settling the question of what to play, and had chosen the most sparkling music she could find. I am anxious to have it recorded that, all uncultured as they were, these boys neither talked nor laughed during the music, but appeared at least to listen. It was Dirk Colson who sat nearest the piano, and who listened in that indescribable way which always flatters a musician. Do you like it? Gracie asked, running off the final notes in a tinkle of melody. His dark face flushed a deep red. I don't know, he said with an awkward laugh. It's queer sounding. I don't see how you make so many tinkles. Do you make all your fingers go at once on those black and white things? Not quite, but sometimes they have to dance about in a very lively fashion. I have to keep my wits at work, I assure you. Is it hard to do? Not very nowadays. When I first commenced, the practicing was horrid. I hated it. What made you do it then? Oh, the same reason which makes people do a great many things that they don't like, she said lightly. I wanted the results. I knew if I worked at it steadily, the time would come when I should not only enjoy it myself, but be able to give pleasure to other people. Why, don't you ever do things that you don't particularly like? He shrugged his shoulders and bestowed on her a very wise look. Often enough, he said fiercely, and he thought of his drunken father. But then I wouldn't if I could help it. That would depend on whether you thought the thing would pay in the end, would it not? Then, without waiting for an answer, she asked, What is your business? My business? with a curiously puzzled air. Yes, how do you spend your time? Hunting up something to eat, he said with a grim smile. Visions of his aimless loafing appearing before him as the only occupation he could be said to have. It had not occurred to him to try to mislead her, but she evidently did not understand. Oh, yes, she said seriously, so I suppose. Isn't it queer how busy men and women have to be day after day and year after year, just getting themselves and others something to eat? Do you have other people to help get it for? Mother, for instance, and little brothers and sisters? I've got a mother, he said, and a sister. And that makes work easier, does it not? I always thought it would be stupid to work all the time just for oneself. But I meant, what do you work at in order to get something to eat? There are so many different ways. How do you know I work at all? Dirk's voice was growing sullen, a consciousness that he would appear at a disadvantage in admitting himself an idler in a busy world was dawning upon him as an entirely new idea. At his question, Gracie turned on her music stool and regarded him with surprise. Why, of course you work, she said. All people do. She was not acting a part. Her experience among poor people was limited to that outwardly respectable class who, however disreputable their conduct might be on Sabbath, had nevertheless a Monday occupation with which they pretended to earn a living. Dirk shrugged his shoulders again. Do they? he said. Her evident ignorance of the world made him good natured. She was not trying to preach to him, he decided, a thing which Dirk hated in common with all persons of his class. 
but the lull in the music had started conversation in other parts of the room. Dirk heard young Reed's question. Mrs. Roberts, do you know of any young man looking for work? I heard of a good situation this afternoon. Oh, there are plenty of applicants, but the gentleman is an old friend of my brother-in-law, and I could speak a helpful word for somebody. I have no one in mind, Mrs. Roberts said and she glanced eagerly at the boys lounging in various attitudes in her easy chairs. Only three of them, she knew, made any pretense of earning their living. Did Alfred mean one of them? Here is a chance for you, young gentleman, she said lightly. Who bids for a situation? What is the place? It was Dirk Colson who asked the question. Ever since he could remember, he was supposed to have been hunting for work, but I am not sure that he ever felt quite such a desire to find it as at that moment. It is at Gray's on Ninth Street, a good chance, but the one who secures it must have a fair knowledge of figures. Oh, land, said Dirk, sinking lower in his easy chair. No use in me asking about it. Are figures your weak point? Mrs. Roberts asked, smiling on him. I can sympathize with you. I had to work harder over arithmetic than at any other study, but I learned to like it. Do you know I think it should be a favorite study with you? It is so nice to conquer an obstinate-looking row of figures, and fairly oblige the right result to appear. What did you find hardest about the study, Mr. Colson? The others chuckled, but Dirk glowered at them fiercely. There's nothing to laugh about as I see, he said. I didn't find nothing hard, because I never had no chance to try. I never went to no school, nor had books, nor nothing. Now that's the truth, and I'm blamed if I ain't going to own it. What a good thing it is that you are young, this was her animated answer. There is a chance to make up for lost time. Mr. Reed, I have such a nice idea. I heard you and Dr. Everett speaking of the literary club the other night. Why cannot we have a literary club of our own? a reading circle, or something of that sort. Suppose we should meet once a week and read aloud something interesting and have talks about it afterwards. Do you ever read aloud? If Mrs. Roberts, in all sincerity, had not been one of the most simple-hearted and in some respects ignorant little creatures on the face of the globe, she could never, with serious face, have addressed such a question to Nimble Dick. Young Reed could not have done it, for he realized the folly of supposing that Nimble Dick ever read anything. By just so much was Mrs. Roberts ahead of him. She supposed that these boys had their literature, and read it, and perhaps met somewhere on occasion and read together. This made it possible for her to ask surprising questions with honest face. "'Bless me,' said Nimble Dick, startled into an upright posture. "'Oh, no, Mum, never!' and even Dirk Colson laughed at the expression on his face. Still, I think you would enjoy it after a little practice, and I can't help fancying you would make a good reader. The boys were all laughing now, nimble Dick with the rest. You're in for an awful blunder there, he said good-naturedly. I'm like Black Dirk, never had no chances, and didn't do nothing worth speaking of with them that I had. Why, bless your body, Mum, I can't even read to myself. I make the awfulest work you ever heard of spelling out the showbills. I have to get Black Dirk to help me, and him and me is a team. By this time Dirk's face had lost its smile, and his fierce eyes were flashing, but the hostess was serene. That doesn't prove anything against my statement. I was speaking of what could be, not necessarily of what was. Let us have a club. The more I think of it, the more it pleases me. I'll tell you, the word club doesn't quite suit me. Let's be fashionable. Gracie, don't you know how fashionable it is becoming to have evenings set apart for special occasions? Mr. Reed, you know Mrs. Judson's Tuesday evenings, and Mrs. Simon's Friday evenings? Very well, let us have our Monday evenings, in which we will do all sorts of nice things, sometimes literary, sometimes musical, and sometimes, well, anything that we please. What do you say, gentlemen? Shall we organize? Mr. Reed, will you give Monday evenings to us? Gracie, you are my guest, and cannot, of course, refuse. It was a novel idea, certainly. Even Alfred, while trying to heartily second her, was in doubt as to what she could hope to accomplish by it. As for the boys, not one of them promised to attend, but neither did they refuse. Mrs. Roberts presently left the subject, seeming to consider her point carried, 
and proposed a visit to the conservatory. I think it very doubtful whether the boy lives who does not like flowers. There are those who seem to consider it a mark of manliness to affect indifference to them, but these, as they grow older, become real men, generally lay this bit of folly aside. Then there are those, plenty of them, who really do not know that they care for flowers. The boys, ushered for the first time in their lives into the full bloom of a conservatory, were, most of them, of this latter stamp. What a scene of beauty it was! Great white callas bending their graceful cups, great red and yellow roses making the air rich with their breath, vines and mosses and ferns and small flowers in almost endless variety. Alfred and Gracie moved among the glories, the latter exhausting all her superlatives in honest delight, although she had visited the spot a dozen times that day, and Alfred, who had been less favored, was hardly less eager and responsive than she. But Mrs. Roberts watched the boys. It was all very well for those two to enjoy her flowers. Of course they would. But what language would the silent, lovely things speak to her untutored boys? They said not a word, not one of them. They made no exclamations. They had no superlatives at command. But Stephen Crowley stooped before a lovely carnation and smelled and smelled, drawing in long breaths, as though he meant to take its fragrance all away with him, and Nimble Dick picked up the straying end of an ivy and restored it to its support again, in a way that was not to be lost sight of by one who was looking for hearts, and Dirk Colson brushed back his matted hair and stood long before a great pure lily and looked down into its heart with an expression on his face that his teacher never forgot. She came over to him presently, standing beside him, saying nothing, then at last she reached forth her hand and broke the lily from its stalk. He started, almost as if something had struck him. "'What did you do that for?' and his voice was fierce. "'I want you to take this for me to your sister, the girl with beautiful golden hair. I saw her one day, and I shall remember her hair and eyes. She will like this flower, and she will like you to bring it to her. Gracie,' raising her voice, "'gather some flowers, will you, and make into bouquets?' These young gentlemen will like to carry them to someone. There must be mothers at home who enjoy bouquets brought by their sons. Over this gently spoken sentence, Nimble Dick laughed a hard, derisive laugh. It made the dark blood flow into Black Dirk's indignant face. Even Alfred Reed lost control for a moment and flashed a glance at him out of angry eyes. How could there be any hope of a boy who sneered at his mother? Yet you need not judge him too harshly. He thought of his mother, indeed, when he laughed. But alas, he thought of her as drunk, and he knew her scarcely at all, save as that word described her. How could mother mean to him what it meant to Alfred Reed, what it meant even to Dirk Colson, whose mother, weak indeed in body and spirit, full of complaining words, oftentimes weakly bitter words to him, yet patched his clothes so long as she could get patches and thread, and would have washed them if she could have got soap, and been able to bring the water, and if her only tub hadn't been in pawn. Oh, yes, there are degrees in mothers. Mrs. Roberts, meantime, broke off blossoms with a lavish hand, and made bouquets for Nimble Dick and for Dirk. He took the bright-hued ones with a smile, but the lily he held by itself, and still looked at it. They went away at last, noisily, growing almost, if not quite, rough towards one another, at least, and directly they were out of the door, Nimble Dick gave a whoop that would have chilled the blood of nervous women. But matron and maiden looked at each other and laughed. We have kept them pent up all the evening, and that is the escape valve being raised to avoid a general explosion. This was Mrs. Roberts' explanation. They were quite alone. Alfred, on being invited in low tones to tarry and talk things over, had shaken his head and replied significantly, Thank you, no. I am one of them, and must stand on the same level. You are right, Mrs. Roberts said, smilingly. You must have been an apt pupil, my friend. That dear sister taught you a great deal. He held up the bouquet which she had made for him. I am going to put it before Esther's picture, he said. Her work is going on. Well, said Gracie, it is over, and we lived through it. And they did all come. I am amazed over that and how they did eat. I suppose the next thing is to open all the windows and air out. 
Flossy Roberts, I'm afraid you are going insane. The idea of your inviting that horde here every Monday. What a parlor you would have. And they would breed a pestilence. They won't come, to be sure, but just imagine it if they should. I really think Mr. Roberts ought to send you home for Dr. Mitchell to look after. Well, Flossy, what next? Next, dear, you must pray. Pray as you never have done before, for the souls of these boys and for the success of my Monday evenings. Gracie, we are at work for immortal souls. Think of it. They must live forever. Shall they, through all eternity, keep dropping lower and lower, or shall they wear crowns? End of chapter 13. Recording by Tricia G.